We are going to jump in. Thank you guys uh, for coming. Um, I know a shockingly small number of you, which is awesome, because normally I feel like I'd be up there in the high 90s. Um, and, uh, but welcome. This is an event um, brought to you by the Jonathan Nelson uh, Center for Entrepreneurship. And the website is entrepreneurship.nelson.brown. .edu, um, and that's the epicenter uh, at Brown of entrepreneurship. Uh, and Danny is the Danny Warshay. Raise your hand, please. Is the executive director and the epicenter of the epicenter of uh, entrepreneurship at Brown. And Jonas and Liz are, is Jonas here. Jonas is the guy behind the guy, and I don't see Liz here. But thanks to the Nelson Center, as always, um, and, and the Slater Center tries to fly in formation with Nelson at all times. Uh, and thank you too for Brown, uh, to Brown for hosting us here. We actually had to change the venue twice to uh, to get all of you people in it, and that's testament to. Uh, well, to our to our guest today, they I'd like heard, to. They heard you were giving out money. That's why. They <laughs> right, yeah, cards, cards before the money. Uh, is Anthony Anthony, uh, Con Litwin Renza is uh, the go-to accounting firm uh, in town. I work with them constantly, and I wanted to invite Anthony, who is our spon our uh, sponsor tonight, to say a few words. Anthony. Thank you, Thon. Uh, so as Thon mentioned, my name is Anthony Mangiarelli, and um, I'm a CPA and a partner and shareholder at a accounting firm, KLR Conlet and Renza. We have four offices, Providence, Newport, Waltham, Boston. And why we're different than the other alphabet soup accounting firms, when I started with the firm 18 years ago, we were 35 people in two converted Victorian houses here on the east side near Brown. Flash forward 18 years, we are the third largest firm in New England. We have over 225 team members. We are the largest Rhode Island-based CPA firm, and we are just really good at being business people. So just to give you an idea of why our firm's a little different and why it's so innovative, not only are we an accounting and advisory firm, but we've expanded our reach and we have different companies under our umbrella. So Jeff Wilhelm's here tonight from Envision Technology Company. Uh, we have our own technology company. That's our go-to people. We have a recruiting team. We have uh, a wealth management team, and the list goes on and on. I don't want to take too much time, because tonight's really about uh, Thorn and, and Steve, and look forward to hearing from them. But I'll just leave you with this. Uh, our marketing folks are here tonight. Kathleen's here. Uh, we have a couple other folks, Joe, Erica from the firm. Outside, we have. Some, some marketing material. And the thing that sets our firm apart is you'll see there's, there's somebody on top of a mountain and they're, they've got their arms up. Why we're so committed to this space is we want to be the people climbing that mountain with you. Support means you throw money at an issue. We're committed to entrepreneurial endeavors locally. We want to be the people climbing that mountain with you. And when we get to that top and throw our hands up, we'll have the six pack of bail with us to share. So thank you. And uh, thank you, Thorne, for letting us be a part of this and look forward to hearing from you, Steve. Thanks. Okay, so just quickly, since I don't know everyone here, I see a bunch of uh, portfolio founders and CEOs. So raise your hand if you've been a Slater Fund CEO or found, raise them high, there we go. Well, there we go. These, these, this is the, the, the bunch to watch here. Um, uh, raise your hand if you're a student. Okay, smattering of students. Raise your hand if you are a professor. There's one, look, we got some uh, teachers here. Okay, raise your hand if you're involved in an accelerator or an incubator. Okay, and some of you are entrepreneurs in that, some of you are teachers of. Okay, all right, and I see business plan winners, grant winners, so that's, that's the uh, that's So how the about raise your hand if you're confused and you don't know what you wanna do? <laughs> great, great. I'm, I, I'll, I'll raise my hand for that one too, all right. Okay, so we're all here tonight uh, to talk with, um, with Steve, and I, I discovered uh, Steve 
actually through books. Uh, I, I read the book and it was really interesting to me and I actually gave it to Danny. And, and Danny uses parts of the book and uh, so that's how we got into it. So thank you for, um, that was Four Steps to the Epiphany. Uh, tonight we actually have 20 copies of the Startup Owner's Manual and that's gonna go to the uh, 20 if we get their most awesome questions. Uh, and they're gonna be autograph books if we have time for that. So, so start thinking now for the killer question because you get an autograph book from Steve on, out of it. Um, so uh, Steve is an, uh, was an entrepreneur first and foremost. He, he's now a teacher. It's not an exaggeration to say he's the godfather of modern entrepreneurship, credited with launching the uh, lean startup, so the lean startup movement. So if you've heard lean startup, if you've heard uh, customer development, uh, customer validation. Uh, these came uh, from his brain because he literally changed how startups uh, are built, how science is commercialized, and how companies and even the government innovates and, and laid out a process for it. Is it easy? No. Is there uh, steps you can follow now? Yes. He's the author of Four Steps to the Epiphany, as I mentioned, the Startup Owner's Manual, and a very influential uh, um, uh, HBS uh, article that kind of launched the lean movement back in 2013. Uh, he teaches at Berkeley, go Bears, uh, Stanford, Columbia, and NYU, um, and me, Eva, he was the founder of the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps, which I have done with, um, I don't see anyone in here that I've done it with, but it's a, an incredible experience. Uh, his hacking for defense class at Stanford is revolutioning, revolutionizing how the defense and intelligence agency are innovating, and it, it goes on and on. But give me uh, a hand for Steve Blank. I'm exhausted already, I don't know about you. It's like on the seventh day he rested. I mean, it's like, what's next? Okay. Uh, so what's your question? Here, here's, how we're, here's how we're going to, to jump in here. Um, you're a successful entrepreneur. You've been through bigger companies. Uh, some of the folks here are familiar with lean processes, uh, but I'm gonna say that some of them aren't as well. Um, a small company is, uh, is, is just different than an established company. Uh, they, they run in different ways. So w what is the key difference between a startup and a more mature company? Yeah, so, so I'm gonna just do a little bit of history. Uh, some of you uh, might remember this and some of you weren't even born yet, but in the 20th century, investors treated startups essentially, without ever saying these words, like they were smaller versions of large companies. Big idea. In the 20th century, if you were an entrepreneur, the pattern worked like this. You wrote a business plan, which looked not much different than the plan you would write inside of a large corporation. It had um, a five-year forecast, which surprisingly, all of them happened to say $100 million of revenue in year five. Um, in fact, I still tell my students there's a secret Excel key code to auto-generate that. Um, you know, it was formatted correctly. Um, if you were teaching entrepreneurship, the, the top book you would buy was by a guy named Jeff Timmons out of Babson, which was the gold standard, 420 pages, which you could boil down to. Entrepreneurship was all about opportunity, resources, and team, which was brilliant, but wrong. Um, and basically, you took that plan, you turned it into 10 or 12 slides, you pitched a VC, um, and if they believed you, they funded the plan. Um, and they maybe ran some numbers, and depending whether it was a bubble or not, you would get, get the money. But here's what happened, is they insisted, consciously or unconsciously, that what you were doing next was simply executing the plan. And by executing the plan, I mean building the products you wrote down, you know, going through waterfall engineering, that is serially building the product, alpha test, beta test, first customer ship, in the meantime, starting to scale sales and marketing, and you have a big bang product launch, and then you'd stand back and the bags of money would just appear in your office and you'd be rich and retired. No, didn't really work like that. You, it would work like that till the bags of money part. 
and then the surprise was is you know you'd have a board meeting six weeks after you launched and everybody be high-fiving the VP of marketing it was great press and look at that and if you did your job it was wonderful and no one would talk to the VP of sales for a while until the board meeting after that another six weeks and they'd go so how are we doing by the numbers remember the numbers are what you got funded on it was this forecast and the VP of sales would say great pipeline now, only some of you are, are laughing because great pipeline means, well, that we're really not making the numbers, but don't worry, right? It's, um, and so another six weeks would go by and this would repeat itself. And depending on the economic con conditions, the VCs would then raise, and in fact, they practice on raising one eyebrow, just one eyebrow, so you should practice, they practice in the mirror because they raise one eyebrow to the CEO and the next time the VP of sales says great pipeline, a puff of smoke appears and a pile of ashes shows up on the, on the seat they were sitting in and a new VP of sales appears. And this goes on for another six months or a year and pipeline, pipeline, and all of a sudden, who gets fired next? The VP of marketing. And then eventually the VP of, uh, uh, the CEO gets fired and maybe the company restarts or runs out of cash. For those of you, anybody lived through this at all? Or, right, so everybody with gray hair, or no hair, in some cases, could tell you that this is exactly the 20th century model. And some of you who are, can't believe this, going, you've got to be kidding. We actually built startups like this? Here was the key insight no one had ever noticed. No one had ever noticed was we were pivoting by firing people, never firing the assumptions of the plan. That is, we assumed that what we funded was inviolate that we all must have been geniuses when God touched us to write that plan, but n therefore any failure of the plan was a failure of an individual to execute. Does that make sense? It's hard to imagine, but that was what was wrong. And the Lean Startup started when I did eight startups in a row, got lucky enough to retire, and actually had time to think about how are we actually funding, managing, and growing startups and realized well, that wasn't quite right. The only time I succeeded was when I fired my own plan. By firing the plan, I meant implicit when you write, wrote a business plan were a series of untested hypotheses. It's a fancy word for you were just effing guessing. And what were you guessing about? Well, you were guessing about who were my customers. You were guessing about what features the customers would want. You were guessing about pricing. You were guessing about what's the right distribution channel. You were guessing about how to create demand. You were guessing about costs and time to market. You were never on time. Um, and, and so all these things, I, because I teach in universities, you have to give them fancy names, I called hypotheses, but you were guessing. And the problem was is we had no tools or techniques to even figure out how do you articulate those guesses? How do you turn those guesses into facts as rapidly as you can? And how do you reduce burn rate of resources, meaning time, money, and people, to make startups more efficient? Um, and so that was the problem space. And, and, uh, and about that time I started thinking about it, the internet bubble of uh, 95 to 2000 collapsed with a, a bank, and all that was left was rubble. And what the rubble was startups were starved by for cash, and venture capitalists were gun shy in investing in anything. Corporate VC disappeared, angel investors, which were just starting to emerge, disappeared, and VCs were hoarding their cash, and startups needed to be extremely efficient about building new ventures. And so what I realized was large companies execute known business models, but startups, startups search for business models. And this, this idea of search versus execution had never been articulated before. Because if we look through the history of business schools, business schools for 100 years were turning out tools for execution, but very few of them were talking about tools for early stage search. In fact, if you would have searched for um, innovation, you would get innovation in large companies, which looked like more of how to write a business plan. And so I realized we needed a management stack for startup founders. And so I wrote a book, which you mentioned, called The Four Steps of the Epiphany, which are kind of articulated. The problem wasn't essentially people. The problem was we were executing hypotheses like they were facts, and that we needed a methodology. And that, came, that started what was called customer development, which was one of the three pieces of what we'll talk about um, that make up with the lean startup. Customer development had one big idea. 
Now, one big idea, which is still valid today, is, and for all of you who are founding CEOs, it, it should embarrass you, there are no facts inside your building, so get the hell outside. And it's counterintuitive to world-class founders. World-class founders intuitively believe they understand the problem, so all they need to do is execute the solution. That is, get out of my way, let me hire the staff and build this damn thing, and again, the only problem we're gonna have is where do we put the bags of money? I have yet to see that work. Yet every founder on day one, because of their passion, believes that's the case. And they don't even consciously believe that what they've, figured, what they've bypassed is not only are they building the solution, is implicitly they think they understand deeply the problem they're solving. And almost always, almost always, founders actually understand the symptom of the problem, not the problem. And, and there is no way to pre-compute all of that by talking to yourself and co-founders. Almost no way. And the other problem is, given where I teach, there's a, um, almost a direct relationship to the smarter the founder, the harder it is to convince them of this. You're supposed to laugh, that's, a, that's kind of a joke. Um, the other piece that happened is one of my students, I'm sorry? It's not funny. It's not funny, it's true, but, um, but it is, and so all of you at Brown could compliment yourself as you're a part of that problem is, you know, dumb people go, yeah, maybe I ought to ask somebody. Smart people go, well, why do I need to ask anybody? I'm like, I, I got it figured out. And can I go on to the last two pieces of lean? Please. Um, so customer development was the first piece, get out of the building. But when I first started teaching this at Berkeley, I had a student named Eric Ries. Um, and most of you might know Eric Ries from his book, The Lean Startup. And Eric had just co-founded a company, um, basically said, Steve, customer de development is great, but in the 21st century, we don't use waterfall engineering anymore, we use agile engineering. That is, instead of building products serially, we now could build them, we have tools to build products iteratively and incrementally using agile engineering. And customer development in agile will probably make a great match. And so Eric became the first practitioner ever of uh, what became the Lean Startup. I sat on his board, he ran uh, engineering, and we ran a series of experiments as he kind of figured this out. Turned out it worked well. And the last piece was, well, how do we keep track of all these hypotheses? Who are the customers? What's the channel? What's the pricing? And someone named Alexander Osterwalder had come up with a single page called the Business Model Canvas. Any of you seen this at all? If you haven't seen the rest of you, you haven't seen Business Model Canvas, there's three books that should be on your shelf. One is Osterwalder's book, Business Model Generation. It basically lays out what used to take 420 pages in Timmins in a single <coughs> diagram. Single diagram. Here are the eight things or nine things you need to worry about. Channel, customers, product features, et cetera. Single diagram. And we use it in Lean to keep track of are these guesses or are these now been validated? Uh, so once we had the business model canvas, we had three components of what actually turned into the Lean Startup. Osterwalder's business model canvas, Reese's observation that if we used agile engineering, we can actually build iterative products, which called minimum viable products to get them out and actually show people stuff rather than just talking to them. And my idea of getting out of the building and like starting to talk to people. And that is the Lean Startup. And the sum of this is that it reduces infant mortality because, as I said, if you're a founder, you believe on day one you're a visionary, but we now have 50 years of data that says almost all of you are hallucinating. <laughs> and so the, the, the role of Lean is to turn a faith-based activity into a fact-based activity before you run out of money. So what was your question? Yeah. So, but we're gonna go deeper than that. Right. Um, when you've read the book, when you've been pounded on by, uh, by coaches, you will eventually get, get out of the office and, uh, and, and be in front of customers. But it's, I would say that it's easier said than done. Okay? Usually, usually difficult. Usually difficult. Um, so I want to get into some of those um, finer points and do's and don'ts. Um, do you still have the videos on the webs on the eponymous steveblank.com right. website about do's and don'ts in a, in an interview? Okay. Um, so 
Entrepreneurs can be an opinionated bunch. Uh, they've built something, they may be in love with it. Um, but I get the sense that there is a difference in what you're talking about between selling what they may already have and, uh, and, and, and working a hypothesis. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. Some of the do's and don'ts that you, that you might do in that meeting, because I think out of the building, getting the meeting is, is, is step one. Let's talk about some do's and don'ts. So, so the biggest do or don't, and, and I, was, I have to tell you, I smile when you say that because I still remember being a passionate entrepreneur, get out of the building for me meant, okay, let me take my demo or slide deck and show it to a customer and say, see, what do you think? Isn't it great? Huh? Right? And then come back and say, I did customer discovery. Because, you know, no one really wants to tell you your baby's ugly. And, and, and in fact, if they tell you your baby's ugly and you're showing it to them, you'll check to make sure you're not holding it upside down. Because like, well, maybe I'm just showing them the wrong end of the product. Um, and, and it turns out that um, it's really difficult to park your enthusiasm and your passion. I mean, this is the yin yang of being a passionate founder because you need that passion to to push against all the odds of like, you know, you should have a day job, for God's sake, um, with now trying to be dispassionate at the same time about trying to gather information. It is very hard, uh, which is why you usually need a great coach. You know, it's the difference between a horse in a pasture and a horse with a jockey. You know, that horse in the pasture has no interest in running around the track until someone's sitting on top of it, kicking it a bit. Um, the same I've found with founders, trying to do discovery and, and dispassionately ask, instead of, do you like my product, trying to first understand, do you deeply understand the problem you're implicitly trying to solve? That is, if you're making a product, underneath it is a set of assumptions about why people will buy it. Right? Not the features or whatever, but what are, what are you trying to solve? Is it entertainment? Is it a office product? Is it something else? Is it you know, an electric car? What is it? Is it, is it just a, an additional feature set? Does it remove a pain? Does it sell, save time? Does it, is it convenience? If you don't understand that, then it, you're going to jump to let me add some more features when they don't like it. Does that make sense? And, and so customer development is really an art. Um, and as you mentioned, what we did with our students is we developed a set of, uh, of videos to kind of do the do's and don'ts. And if you go to steveblank.com, there's a tab on the top called slides and videos, and you'll see a whole series of customer discovery videos on, on kind of how to do this right and how to do it wrong. And, and again, it's, it's not that people are dumb when they do this, it's that the, the incredible passion of a founder to drive to a conclusion gets in your way of gathering data. Uh, does that make sense to that? Uh, absolutely. So yeah. uh, Danny uh, from the Nelson Center actually uh, taught me that the, the metaphor in Japan for empathy uh, is they talk about synchronizing your hearts. Yes. Um, and I've been in a, in a bunch of meetings with, uh, with entrepreneurs and customers where I actually had to kick the entrepreneur to get them to... So what's the ratio of, of talking to listening in the uh, ideal customer discovery? Um, you know, it's infinite because you need to shut up most of the time, which is just... just if, how many of you think you're passionate founders? Right? How many of you think... Keep your hands up and think you could be quiet for 10 minutes in a meeting? Yeah, well, some of you, good. Um, for the rest of you, I, I couldn't. It was like I spent 20 years being kicked under the table. I'm surprised I could still walk. Um, it's, it's really hard um, because you want to tell people about your passion and your vision. Um, you know, there's a whole art to this customer uh, discovery, and I'll uh, give you the distinction in a second, but at Stanford, there's a whole building built around something called design thinking, which is kind of another way to think about getting out of the building and building empathy with customers and trying to understand users' needs ab initio, that is, from first principles. What's driving users? Uh, why would they buy something? What do they need? You know, how do I build prototypes? How do I find, you know, um, uh, empathy with them? How do I understand their archetypes, right? And for me, the easiest goal is, okay, well, help me understand who the first customers are going to be. 
not the first orders in revenue, you know, are they male, are they female, are they if you're inside of a company, are they consumers, geographic things, demographic things, what do they read, what do they buy? If you don't know that, then you don't know exactly what you're chasing and you don't know why you're doing discovery. The biggest idea about customer discovery is that it is not sales. It's a huge concept. Customer discovery and customer development is not about selling anything. And in, and in fact, that's the real like light bulb, is that if you're in, in the 20th century, the goal of getting out of the building and talking to people was, okay, I'm glad I listened to you, now will you give me an order? <laughs> and yes, I'll take one, but that's not the goal. The goal is you're trying to find, you're ready for this, enough data to build the repeatable and scalable sales process. And you're doing that by testing all these hypotheses about do I understand the archetypes of my customers? Are these the right ones? Are these kind of, oh, wait a minute, in a company there are the users, but they might not be the economic buyers, and they might not be the influencers, they might not be the recommenders. There might be a hierarchy of people I actually need to talk to, but I was confused, and it actually happened to me, thinking that the users were the buyers. Turned out the users didn't matter at all. Mm. Turned out it was the economic buyers I should have been, by the way. Oh, and it also turned out I needed to talk to IT, which I wasn't even on my list of people I needed to talk to. So some more, when I sold video games in one company, I thought my customers were the 14-year-old kids. Guess what, unless they were stealing money from mom's wallet, those weren't the buyers. Oops, oops, you know, needed to understand that. Um, and so the goal is to do enough discovery so eventually when you build the repeatable process, you've understood all the points that you now have a sales channel that you literally could go implement because you've done the hard work. And customer validation is the next step in saying, okay, let's try to do some early sales based on the data we have. And if we've nailed it, just the money should pour in. And it almost never works like that. Then you discover something else you missed. When I did the uh, i yep. uh, thing, and uh, should I explain i -Corp for 30 seconds? So i -Corp was basically all this theory, you know, lean, get out of the building, build MVPs. I, I wrote about this, Eric wrote about it, Osterwalder wrote about it, but if you were in a university taking a class up to 2011, you took a class on how to write a business plan. That was the capstone class in any university in the United States to 2011, plus or minus. Brown obviously had much smarter classes then, but anywhere else, that was, the, that was it. And it wasn't that people were dumb, it was just that we didn't know what else to teach. Even though we kind of had the theory, there were no other classes. Even I was teaching how to write a business plan, realizing I was lying to my students, because no business plan survives first contact with customers. None. Certainly not in startups, and most often not even in large companies. And so what should replace it? So in 2011, I kind of said, we're gonna start from scratch, from first principles. And so I put together a class that said, every week I'm gonna teach my students a piece of the business model. What's a customer? What's a channel? What's pricing? You know, what, what's regulatory issues? That is, depending on, on, on what industry they were in, all the pieces they needed to know. And because I was teaching in an engineering school, they all thought that a company was all about their technology. I invented X and therefore, how hard can this be? And for those of you who've run this, you know, you kind of know a little harder. And if those of you who don't, trust me, it's a lot harder than just inventing, unless it's anti-gravity, after maybe that. Um, and, and so we were gonna teach them part of the business model every week, but number one is they were gonna form teams before they joined the class. You were gonna apply as a team. Number two is, not only were we gonna teach you part of the business model, every week, including your full course load, you were gonna get out of the building and talk to 10 to 15 customers or partners a week. And you were gonna build and show up with a new minimum viable product every week. Could be a PowerPoint slide in the beginning, but eventually it became software or hardware. Multiply by 10 weeks, at the end of 10 weeks, you've talked to over 100 customers and partners and built five to 10 iterations of your product. And the final presentation was not a, a incubator demo day, here's how smart I am at the end. It included that, but it was actually the story of here's what I thought on day one, and I knew what you thought on day one, because you had to present every week. So I had your original slides. Here's what I thought, here was our journey, here's how we did something called a pivot, which is a fundamental thing of a startup, which said, when I get out of the building, some of my hypotheses are gonna be wrong. 
In the 20th century, if that happened, we fired you. Seriously, we fired the CEO of you wrong. Failure was not acceptable. In the lean methodology, we assume that all you have are hypotheses and some of them are gonna be wrong and that's an integral part of learning. And we call that a pivot, which is in my definition, a pivot is a substantive change to one or more of those business model uh, uh, elements, hypotheses. That is, gee, I thought the customers were X, they're actually Y. I thought the channel was over here, no, the channel's here. I thought the, the revenue model should have been, you know, uh, I don't know, direct sales, but it's actually subscription. All those are okay to change as long as you're doing them rapidly. So in any case, we taught this class. It was the first time it was ever taught. And I decided to blog every week of the class live. You know, here are my slides, here are my students' slides, here's what, what worked, here's what didn't. What I didn't realize is back in Washington, and the head of commercialization of the National Science Foundation was reading every week of the class. Like they said, like it was a serialized novel. The class ends, I get a phone call that says, hi, you don't know me, head of commercialization, National Science Foundation. We think you invented the scientific method for entrepreneurship. <laughs> okay, got anything else? <laughs> well, we want you to teach the class for the US government. O okay, you know, I could fit you in next year in 90 days. <laughs> I went, well, why? Well, we we have this program called the SBIR and STTR program, which basically funds, anybody know this? Or, uh, all right, some of you, right? How many of you have gotten a, a grant? Oh, great. Or how many of you have been through i -Corp? <laughs> Don't hit me. <laughs> Those of you have been through the class, you know what that means. Um, but basically, the government hands out commercialization grants, that is money to build a company, to any scientist who's gotten a, a science grant from, from a research agency. And for 30 years, it hadn't worked too well because we didn't, the money didn't come with any instructions. It just came with, good luck, <laughs> let us know, you know, have a good time. And so they decided that this was a class, a framework, that for the first time didn't require principal investigators, that is academics who were scientists to ha become MBAs. It was pretty understandable because hypothesis testing, we've been doing that as scientists for 500 years, right? You create a hypothesis, you design an experiment, you, you know, you get out of the building, you collect some data, and then you do one of three things with that data. You either validate the hypothesis, you invalidate it, or you modify it. And that's what implicitly I was teaching about the Lean Startup Method. And so we ran a prototype for the government. Um, we taught it at Stanford, and then I trained the professors at University of Michigan and, and uh, Georgia Tech. And i is now taught in, as mentioned earlier, in 81 universities, and we've put 1,500 teams of the country's best scientists, including the people who raised their hand here, um, through that process. And they will tell you it is not fun as you're going through it, but it, it's life-changing when you've gone after. Um, and what the NSF wanted to do was not only expose those scientists to commercialization activities, but it forever changes their perspective on their, as, as their students go out and start companies, they now know more than most of the investors that they're talking with because they actually had a call on customers. So that was i -Corp. Can Can I? Yeah. So two things. When he says don't hit me. Yeah. Um, when you're told to go see 10 customers in week one, it depends what business you're trying yeah. to get in. Yeah. It's a non-trivial exercise. It's frightening to death. I remember the first time I had to do this just as a, you know, as a marketing guy, and someone said, well, you're not a marketing guy unless you've actually been outside the building, which was great advice. I, you know, I used to call people, but first I, I, you know, to set up meetings, but first I remember, literally, I remember staring at the phone, hoping it would dial itself, because <laughs> like, <laughs> there's no way I want, you know, I was, no way I wanted to talk to people. I was having more fun inside the building thinking great thoughts. <laughs> what do you mean talk to people? I don't even like those people. Why would I talk to them? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, and they're not, they're not very smart, and you know, all I want is their money, and like, and, and then I got to go with salespeople who have gold chains, and you know, what is, <laughs> What's that fancy car? I knew. Like, oh God! And and then I learned. I was having. To, finally learned. I was having a ball. I actually ended up liking it. But for the first time, particularly if you're a world-class engineer or scientist, to actually get out and and talk to people who are not in your field or 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 gee, you know, what's this selling? Thing? Am I selling or am I listening or? Do they get it? It's just really confusing. And that's why treating all this as hypothesis testing 
with a framework and a methodology that says, no, 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 you're testing, are these the right people to talk to? Or do you need to talk to regulators? Or do you need to figure out how to get reimbursed if you're talking about a medical device or a diagnostic? Or, you know, or if you're doing social entrepreneurship, gee, is, am I building this for the people I'm serving or am I actually building this for donors? You know, which is very, turns out there, the answer is yes to both. Does that make sense? It's incredibly painful because it's a social engineering problem, not a technology problem. So when I did it in Maryland, um, there were teams, and, and it, is, it is emotionally bruising to bruising. some people. And I, I didn't actually, I was a mentor, but I didn't actually enjoy watching it that much because some people are told, well, you didn't, you talk to one customer, that's, that's not 10. And you fail for the week, right? And it's, and it's difficult. Um, one team that, and, and in, this te in, this, in Maryland, we met together in, in person. Groups would meet. And one team, after, after um, having been uh, dressed down a little bit, called in the next, the next week. They said, uh, I'm, I'm not coming. And they said, well, where are you? They said, I found a trade show in Houston. There are 400 customers here. I dropped $285 on a plane ticket. I'm not coming to your pitch. I'm not coming to your weekly meeting because I've just bagged 30 customer interviews right. in two days. Right. And they're like, okay, I, I think you passed this week. And again, there's nothing religious about 10, but there is... Um there is enormous value in density and velocity of customer interviews. Um, you know, if you're doing an online app, talking to 10 people a week is noise, right? There's, you're just going to get noise. You need to somehow be able to connect with hundreds or, or thousands to get valid data. If you're selling enterprise software, you know, talking to 10 a week is huge. You know, I'm happy if you talk to, you know, three to five companies. Maybe you talk to five or six different people inside those companies. Um, but but unless you have density and velocity of customer data, it's really just like you're guessing. And my, my favorite, uh, favorite one, which we have on video, is uh, when we started teaching this class for life sciences at the National Institute of Health, one of the first teams that got up when we challenged them that says, well, all you are is guessing. He said, well, gee, I'm an MD, PhD. I, I know all this stuff, and I happen to say, Gee, um, unfortunately, the entire room is full of MD PhDs, and they and they actually got out of the building and found some real data. Um, and it, as I said, you run into the problem of as smart as you are, the harder it is for you to do this because it's it's countercultural. It's you know why am I doing this and what's the point? And, and the point about discovery is you truly are not just randomly talking to people. You're actually running a series of continual experiments. Is, is this the right archetype? Do I even understand the archetypes of my customers? Do I understand, you know, can I diagram out the sales process? Who will I be calling on first, second, or third? Do I understand the economics of my distribution channel if I'm online? Can I actually take you through the numbers of customer acquisition costs, lifetime value, cash flow positive, when, you know, all the metrics, which are different, by the way, for different businesses. But unless I could diagram the entire playbook, you don't know enough. You simply don't know enough. And if you have infinite cash, I'm gonna tell you a secret, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you have infinite cash, you'll get to do what we did in the dot-com bubble, and you know, cash will make up for all your mistakes. So if you have infinite cash, ignore everything you're hearing tonight. Seriously. If you have limited cash, then all of a sudden you have to be frugal with how you kind of spend your time and, and, and your burn rate. <clears throat> so um, I get the notion, you gotta talk to five or 10. Let me whine a little bit. Um, the product that I'm selling, it's really kind of a C-suite thing. Uh, I, I sell it to CTOs, I sell it to CEOs. So whatever you're coaching them to do, it's, let's be honest, it's a little different for me, right? Do I get a pass on that? So I, I, I used to screw that one up <laughs> multiple times. In fact, there were two versions of that. The, number one is, you know, like, here. Assume you have a world-class board of directors and they, and early in your company, could get you a meeting with any CEO you want, right? How many of you are gonna take that meeting? Okay, yeah. Now, people raise their hand. How many meetings are you ever gonna get with that CEO? 
Yeah, one. One. You're going to get one meeting. How much do you think you know on day one about their company or their problems? Right, probably zero. So it turns out for me, I used to make this mistake. I'd take that meeting and tell them all about X and Y, be talking, 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 and then as their eyes are glazing over, realize I don't have a clue why I'm there other than my board was great enough to set up a world-class meeting, which I just kind of blew. So imagine instead you actually spent some time talking to people lower down in their organization, right? And people lower down in an organization will actually tell you how screwed they are. Now imagine you took the meeting with the CEO a month later and said something like, you know, it's probably not your company, but lots of other companies we encounter have problems like X. And if, it's, if you're good at this, they'll say, huh, that's interesting, we have problems like X. And, they, and you go, well, you know, some of those other companies are, you know, solving problem X by building solutions like this. Yeah, we're trying to do that too. And, you know, most of them have kind of discovered that that's a really expensive way is, you know, the reason I'm here is, and I'm sure, you know, like it's not of interest, but we have a package solution to kind of deliver X. Really? Have you talked to my CIO? And, you know, let me introduce you to X or Y. The, the conversation makes a lot more sense when you've actually prepped the order of battle. That is, you don't go to war without understanding what, what all the things are that you're trying to solve. You didn't even understand the problem. The other, the other version of that mistake I used to make is when I was selling to companies. How many of you were doing B2B sales? You mean doing B2B? All right. Business to business sales. Um, I used to look at the list of the market leaders and say, well, obviously, I need to talk to the number one company in the field. How many of you believe that? I need to call in market leader. Well, what I painfully discovered, I was a very slow learner, the market leader thinks they're the market leader. And therefore, they don't think they need any new technology or anything else. And it, and again, this is a heuristic, it's not written in stone, but it turns out that the people you tend to want to call on is the number two through four people in a market who want to be the market leader, who actually might want to have some new technology or service that could actually get them to be the number one. So, you know, when I was in the semiconductor business, my first instinct was always to call on Intel. Well, Intel would say, no, nope, we got that covered, don't worry. But calling on AMD, they would buy anything because they, they were desperate. I mean, they were just trying to stay in business. I don't want to be number. But does that make sense? So, so one is it doesn't mean don't call on the CEO or don't call on high-level exec A or B. It just means think about how many potential meetings you're going to get before you blow that meeting. And it doesn't mean uh, don't call on a regulator or don't call on someone else, but it just means you need to be a little more prepared before you blow the one meeting you're going to have. Was that your question? That's uh, one of them. Yeah, all right. So you, you, in your class, you did 100 meetings for yeah. some of these things. Yep. Yeah. Can you, can you ever do it for less? I mean, what, what's enough? How can you tell? Yeah, so the enough thing is a great question, and the enough thing is a pretty simple heuristic. Is when you start getting the same data over and over again, it's not a numbers game. And number two is, you gotta understand what the goal of, the, of, the, of getting out of the building is. This is a big one. The goal, and this is why this is, I'm gonna explain why this is diff different than design thinking. The goal of getting out of the building for the lean startup is to inform the founder's vision. This is not a giant focus group. Big idea. And I'm gonna give you a concrete example, it happened to me in a class in a school back west, um, where my students got out and they were trying to figure out pricing for an app. And it was an app, and they went out, and, and, and because I make my students blog every interview they do outside the building, I kind of have foreknowledge of what they're gonna present. So I knew what they were gonna put up, and they put up this great spreadsheet that said, we're gonna price the app at $9.99, and I, kind of led them along. I said, why don't you share with the class why you know that? And they proudly put up the spreadsheet that said, you know, 47 people said, you know, less than $10. And I said, well, show us the other three numbers on there. All we discarded, though, they were outliers. Well, remind the class what numbers you discarded. Well, three people said they'd pay over $10,000. It was enterprise software. But, you know, obviously, Professor Blank, 47 is bigger than three. You should all laugh, right? It's a big idea. Is that 
customer discovery is not add up all the, all the data you have. You're founders, damn it. You're looking for signals out of noise. It's a big idea. You're not looking for, you know, like, okay, we're gonna add up all the feature requests and that's what we're gonna add to engineering and we're gonna add up all the pricing stuff. No, if, for example, for features, you're trying to figure out what's the minimum feature set. Big idea. For pricing, you're trying to look for the outliers. Is there somebody that's trying to give us a signal that our hypothesis about market and place because we don't know about it. This, this was a team that had no idea what enterprise software was. They were in the, they were students. They thought everything was a consumer app. And I had to explain to them that they just got a signal that said, oh my God, this thing might be a lot more valuable than you actually think to a segment of people. And they actually should have been measuring the dollars under the curve rather than the, you know, the number of, of, of interviews. Why this is different than design thinking is getting out of the building, as I said, goal one is to inform the founder's vision. Goal two, at least in my world, when I developed this process, it was because I had a gun to my head that said burn rate. Burn rate says I eventually, unless I find product market fit, that is the match between what I'm building and customers, I'm gonna run out of money and my company will die. So I had a finite amount of time to find product market fit. And so therefore, the customer discovery tools and the methodologies I was using is subtly but importantly different than design thinking. Anybody familiar with design thinking? You're all kind of sitting on this side for some reason. So design thinking is um, basically IDEO and, and uh, Procter and Gamble. It was a set of discovery tools outside the building. They're wonderful tools, but where they come from is pretty important. They come from large companies who were thinking about building new products. And implicitly that was, we're gonna spend 100 million bucks in launching a product, building a factory, et cetera, and I needed complete evidence to convince my CFO and division general manager and maybe board of directors that, I, that this was a worthwhile endeavor. And so I needed 100% facts. Does that make sense? In a startup, I'm making good enough decision making. That's a radical difference than a large company trying to make a decision to build and launch a $100 million endeavor. And so if you're a startup founder, you're using customer discovery to fill out essentially a sparse matrix, and you're making decisions always on imperfect data. And if you're not comfortable doing that, you shouldn't be running a startup. There's never enough data in a startup for you to make perfect decisions. Make, make sense at all? It wasn't even a question you asked, but um, and, and that's why startups feel chaotic. And if, and if it doesn't feel chaotic, you're not moving fast enough. Truly not moving fast enough. Or because you've just turned it into a lifestyle business. Um, and if you do that, then that's fine, but you're not gonna scale. So I want you guys to be thinking of, uh, of questions here because we're going to turn it over in a second to, uh, to hear some founders and professors and entrepreneurs uh, ask really tough questions. So think of them. And for the best 20 questions, we're going to give out autographed uh, copies. Um, it sounds like the shopping channel, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> so <clears throat> you said that startups are different than, than big companies. The first guy we had here in this series in January was uh, the chief product officer for Pearson, um, the education, you know, enormous uh, company, far flung all over the world. Now, he actually came out of a startup. They bought his... He was chief. He was the CTO of a company in New York that they bought, um, and he talked to us about running a big company. He's using lean. He won't let a product anywhere near the shelves until his teams have gone out. And so he's actually using lean in in his product management across hundreds of teams. So uh, are the distinctions blurring here, or is the is the toolkit spreading? What do you think about that? I think he's a huge exception, um, and, and a successful one, and, and uh, um, it's an amazing accomplishment, because the what's happened in the last five years is, anybody work in large companies right now? Any, any large company execs? Um, or just employees? Thank you. Um, so large companies in the last five years, if you haven't noticed, are being disrupted at a rapid rate by startups. Um, 
which again, never occurred in the 20th century. The notion in the 20th century that a startup would raise more money than a company has to spend on R&D was insane. You know, a startup with 10 million bucks was thought of as a large, well-funded startup, right? And then now in the 21st century, startups have hundreds of millions of dollars, exceeds the R&D budget of a good number of, of corporates. Number two is in the 20th, 20th century, no VC would touch a startup whose implicit business model says, first we break the law, then we make a ton of money. Anybody think of what companies those are? Sure. Who? Uber. Uber, who else? Airbnb, Tesla for distri distribution, right? And all of them are implicitly breaking the law because from their point of view, these large markets are locked up by rent seekers. We could have that argument for, for years, but, but that would never have gotten funded at scale or let alone at all. Um, and so large companies are being disrupted by not only the technology shifts we see about internet changing distribution channel, whatever, but these other things occurring to them. And so in the last five years, most of them have looked to startups to kind of say, okay, what are the startup tools and techniques for rapid innovation? And they all have, almost every large company has kind of an incubator and accelerator and over 200 of them have what are called innovation outposts in Silicon Valley, like, you know, remote offices to kind of look for technology and maybe invest in them. Um, and what they've discovered in the last five years, Pearson being the exception, is that if you look back and say, okay, how many of these activities have actually moved the needle in revenue, market share, or profits? The answer is very few. Again, Pearson being a, a great success, and W.L. Gore and a couple of others being the exception. In fact, what most of them created was innovation theater rather than innovation. And you kind of ask why, what, what happens? And if you've been in a startup and gone to a large company, or if you've been to a large company and go to a startup, you kind of recognize this, but for the rest of us, it's worth remembering, in a startup, what percentage of people are working on innovation? What percentage? A hundred. You ready for this? In a large company, what percentage of people are creating new products? So, Small, right? Small. So what's the rest of the people in a large company doing? Executing. They're executing, not only ex the, this phrase existing business model translates to, they have a business card which actually is a virtual hot link to a job spec, right? That job spec is a known spec of a known process that actually is repeatable. Right, they come to work, if they're confused, they look at their business card, if they're more confused, they pull out their job spec and say, oh, I'm responsible of getting paper from this desk to this desk, or I'm responsible for you know, product management, or I'm responsible for writing the data sheets of here to here. And by the way, I don't say that as a pejorative, I say that's, that's how we manage and scale large companies. That's, in fact, the nature of, of corporations, at least to date. The problem is those processes, procedures, HR manuals, finance rules, legal, whatever, strangle innovation in its crib. It's not that large companies don't have innovators inside. What they don't have are innovation processes that are parallel to their execution processes. And people have been writing about this for decades. Uh, Touchman and O'Reilly, Stanford and, and I think Harvard or MIT, coined this notion in the 20th century called an ambidextrous organization that you needed to chew gum and walk. It was a nice to have in the 20th century. It's like required to stay in business in the 21st. Most companies have not gotten that right. Most companies are still tripping over themselves because high level leadership in almost every large company, you, here, large company CEOs, they come from the innovation side or the execution side? execution side. Again, there are exceptions, but most large company CEOs have been world-class executors, sales, finance, whatever. We know how to scale, we know how to manage budgets, we play a great game of golf with customers and whatever, but they're not innovation creators. And so therefore, when you try to explain to them that no, you need to run a different process internally at a faster clock speed, you know, and by the way, we need process, process and regulations exceptions, smoke comes out of their ears. Because by the way, that's what not their board isn't looking for, and more importantly, activist investors are not looking for that. 
if anybody wants a sad story, we'll look at what happened to GE and Procter & Gamble, who've both been taken apart by the same activist investors and being sold off for its pieces. So unless you have dual class stock or some way to kind of control uh, investors, even if you care about innovation, the street won't let you have that runway to go invest in it. Did I answer any part of your question? Or? Beautiful. All right. Okay, exit question. I'm gonna give you a choice. Yeah. Customer development, does it work every time? Or which company do you wish you had started when you saw one of the things coming out to you just say, oh my God, I wish I had been part of that company? You know, so like any good entrepreneur, I'm gonna answer a different question. Um, so, there's a variant of that. So Tesla started in my living room and I walked away from it. Um, so so two, I'm gonna tell you inside baseball stories I never told anybody. So number one is, um, uh, Elon Musk's first job in Silicon Valley, he was my intern. Uh, and, I, and I had no idea. I, I, my chief operating officer years later said, remember that kid you used to yell at a lot? He found something called PayPal, or actually X.com, which PayPal bought. Um, and then um, when, I, when I retired in 99, um, after eight startups, I was done. I, you know, I, I kind of made the decision of whether you work to live, which was my first 20 years, or do you live to, well, do you live to work or do you work to live? And I finally decided uh, I was going to figure out how to do something else. Somebody came to me with an idea for an electric car, and it was a kid named J.B. Straubel. Anybody know who he is? He's the inventor of all this, the um, um, Tesla technology. He's the chief engineer at Tesla, did all the battery technology, the drivetrain, et cetera. He was driving around Palo Alto in a, in a Porsche he had personally converted as a 20-some-odd-year-old with a lead-acid battery trailer behind it, powering his, no, seriously. <laughs> and so for six weeks, him and um, uh, the then head of Nissan's uh, Palo, Alto, Palo Alto Research uh, uh, Group uh, decided we were gonna build an electric car. And uh, this was gonna be my ninth startup. And I quickly realized, I said, this is gonna take 10 years and $50 million. Well, I was off by only another 20 years and probably, a, I think by now, 100X. And I said, you know what? I just can't do it anymore. And, and Strabo was just really angry. He said, this is a great idea. It's, someone's gonna do it. And he went off and founded Tesla with a, um, another entrepreneur named Martin Eberhardt. Um, uh, turned out uh, Elon Musk was actually the investor, not the founder, though managed to get himself written into history. And by the way, the company would not have been a success without um, Musk being the, you know, the new CEO. Let me just close, though, with something that, um, you know, we kind of know, but it's worth repeating. And I was just thinking about Musk and Straubel. Every great, at least technology startup, has at least an innovator and an entrepreneur. And they're almost never the same person. The innovator is somebody like Straubel, or somebody like Steve Wozniak, or somebody like Paul Allen at Microsoft, or somebody, want, this is a great, could be a technology entrepreneur, could be some business person who has a great insight, this has somebody else. But you know what? A, a, a startup with just an innovator is like one hand clapping. Almost always you need an entrepreneur. Somebody who kind of gets the technology but is world class in creating a reality distortion field that allows you to attract capital beyond all rational means to recruit people to quit great day jobs, to convince the press and, and early customers to buy buggy unfinished software. And so in my career, I was the entrepreneur who was good at finding world-class innovators to partner with. And then teams tend to be built around that. And the last couple of years in the, in the web space, we would always say you need a hacker, hustler, and designer. Uh, but in every domain, there's a combination of teams. So when we talk about team, we're actually talking about the team that both has the insight and capability to deliver the product, in addition to the team member that's capable of creating this vision that people find incredibly compelling and, and has to be part of. Okay, so, once, questions. Who's got a question for, there we go. All right, I'm gonna go there because it's closest. Uh, so we, let's see, I guess we need a microphone to walk around with, right? Isn't there number three? 
Or can somebody hand out the mic to the speakers? Do you have one, Nancy? Oh, there it is. Okay. Let's get some books, too. Can we get some books and or we'll do that afterwards? Okay. Here you go. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for your insights. Um, I'm very inspired. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and I also uh, work as a community development manager for a small community bank and I'm constantly helping um, business owners, self-employed individuals um, to get access to capital. So I'm always encouraging them for the business plan because I know my underwriters, I know my lenders. So I'm just wondering if you know of any uh, financial institutions that um, are utilizing the business canvas to, um, to extend credit, if there are any other innovative practices out there for business owners that have challenging credit? So, so let me give you the short answer and a little longer answer. So the short answer is I would talk to Silicon Valley Bank in, in the Valley and see what they're using. I mean, they are kind of the current bankers of the Valley. That's the that's short answer. The longer answer is you, you said something interesting that we all should kind of remember. You're, you're talking to small business owners, is that correct? So for, for me, when I first started teaching entrepreneurship, having been an entrepreneur, luckily someone at Berkeley was smart enough to say, Steve, before you start teaching, you might want to sit through some of these other entrepreneurship classes. And I sat through my first entrepreneurship class and didn't understand the darn thing they were saying, going, wait a minute, I did this for 20 years, how come I don't know what they're talking about? And it turned out they were teaching small business entrepreneurship. It's a big idea. It turns out that for those, how many of you are tech entrepreneurs in this room, some technology? It turns out that's not the only entrepreneurship there is. There's a taxonomy of, of entrepreneurship. So you could be a small business entrepreneur, but by the way, 99.5%, according to the SBA, of all companies in the U.S. are less than 500 people. And by my definition of a small business is you have no interest in raising risk capital, right? You're raising bank loans or, and you're not hiring the best of what are you hiring, your cousin or your family or local people from schools or whatever. And your goal isn't to create a billion dollar company. You want to feed the family. And if you happen to open up two stores, you're, you're lucky. That's small business, Main Street entrepreneurship in the United States. That is innovation entrepreneurship. But that's very different from what we've been talking about here, which is what I call scalable startups. Startups designed from day one to scale, and the risk reward is completely different than small business entrepreneurship. Small business entrepreneurship, because I got a bank loan and I had a sign for that darn thing, I'm not betting my, you know, my house. Gee, for a, a startup doing scalable start, I got his money. What do I care? <laughs> and he wants me to take risks, all right? I mean, that's the whole idea. And I can get world-class people if I have a big enough vision. That's, that's taxonomy, too. Then there's corporate entrepreneurship, right? Well, wait a minute. We just described how that's different. I'm fighting against, swimming against the stream there. And then there's social entrepreneurship. Wait a minute. If I'm using the business model canvas, there's a box called revenue. How do I deal with that? And there's a box called distribution channel. By the way, we have a different canvas for government and nonprofits called the mission model canvas. Where when, for those of you interested, just look, mission model canvas, Steve Blank and you. Osterwalder and I uh, came up with a variant on the canvas where revenue isn't the, the stream. Does this make sense for, uh, so you've got to ask whether you're an entrepreneur or you're teaching entrepreneurship or you're funding entrepreneurship as an angel, you know, which one am I actually funding? And the press is all about scalable startups, but that's not the only type of startup there is. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Yep. Okay, right here. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve, just a, a couple of years ago, I was at a, um, a venture co competition at HBS, and okay. one, of the, um, one of the judges, an African VC, asked uh, one of the entrepreneurs to think about their product having failed and what they would do about it. So my question to you, you've alluded to it a little bit when you talk about the pivot, is would you be kind enough to share what your greatest failure <laughs> has been. <laughs> um, so, so you know, uh, sometimes lean, one of the key uh, 
benefits people uh, talk about is it allows you to fail fast, and isn't that great? Uh, let me give you a hint uh, for those of you who've never failed. It sucks, um, big time. Um, the nice part about a pivot versus a failure is a pivot, um, if you're moving fast enough, doesn't look like a failure at all. It looks like continuous learning. It's a big idea. If you and your investors are aligned that, gee, we're getting data and we're learning that, no, this wasn't the customer segment, or no, these features, even though we said on day one, here's features one to 10, but customers are trying to grab feature three, seven, and nine, that's not failure, that's learning. Does that make sense so far? And a pivot is just an integral part of that process rather than we're blindly executing the plan. But I'm gonna answer, a, so maybe your question is, I have failed massively and publicly. And, and, and that is, in fact, one of the characteristics of an entrepreneur is not that failure is an integral part of it, you hear it, but how do you deal with it? Um, and so uh, my next to last startup, I thought I was you know, a smart, I'd done a ton of them, or just raised $35 million, which back then was real money, not a seed round. Um, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was on the cover of Wired magazine, and it was like, I don't know if we, is Wired still around? It's like, we used to kill dead trees, put ink on them, and before everything went on mobile. Um, and then I realized 90 days later, I was like, gonna fail, like publicly. And when I did, I had to call my mother, you know, and English was not her first language, and you know, it was always simultaneous translation, and I said, Mom, I lost $35 million. First words out of her mouth after thinking and translating, she said, oh, where'd you put it? <laughs> <laughs> I had to explain that. Then she broke into other languages and said, oh my God, the country we came from is gone. You know, there's nowhere else for us to go. I said, no, the reason I'm calling is the people who gave me the $35 million just gave me, or lost it, just gave me another $12 million to do my next one. And, and and I'm telling you the story, not because it was about me, but I returned a billion dollars each to my two investors. But that's not a story of me, that's a story of a entrepreneurial cluster that embraced failure as learning. In fact, you know you're in an entrepreneurial cluster, and you should test this in Providence, is you know we have a special name for a failed entrepreneur in, in an entrepreneurial cluster. Anybody know what it's called? Experienced. Experienced. It's a big idea. If you have an honest failure, investors will go, well, you know, tell me what happened. And if your first words out of your mouth is it was everybody's fault, you're never gonna raise money in that town again. But if you could say, let me tell you, you know, what I learned, what I should have done, what I would have, whatever. And I went through, trust me, all the steps into denial, anger, you know, like it wasn't my fault, it was, you know, my co-founder, it was like everybody should have, whatever, until finally, in fact, the lean startup came from me thinking about what went wrong and, you know, gee, and, and in that case, hubris and not getting out of the building and talking to my customers, the twin failures of, of smart entrepreneurs. And I checked every one of those boxes. And so the, the last startup I did was basically built on what I learned from that failure and having to process that, trust me, was extremely painful. Um, but it's what got us the lean startup and actually, um, that's why I've been retired 20 years. Uh, did I answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah. Who else? Abe. So I'm, I'm Abe. I'm a local startup founder, a company called Tizra, which is one of Thorne's companies. Um, I'm one of his dumb founders, so I should be really good at this. Um, and and the, the ch one of the challenges that, uh, that we have is kind of like that being in between, being a tiny company, really feeling a lot of urgency about pivoting, but also having a business which is basically paying the bills, basically funding you know, our ability to look for the pivot. Do you have any advice on kind of how to strike that balance? Yeah, how I, to I've achieve the focus you need I, to do? I, I, I've seen this a lot, it's a great question. And for, for those you didn't hear it is, you know, gee, we're now starting to make some money and we've, we've pivoted, but now but we've made money, but we're not scaled, right? We're, so what do we do? And, and, um, and, and I have to tell you that's a death trap, not that, you, that you've caused it, but I've seen this movie before, is that people get comfortable in that and you end up in what I call, in shorthand, the land of the living dead. You have a salesperson who's quite, um, I'm just not talking about your company, but in general, hey, we you know grew from 1 million to 1.3 million. Look, we went up 30%, how, what could you ask me to do? 
well, I'm going to fire everybody if that's if everybody's comfortable doing that. That's not a startup. That's a, that you've declared yourself a small business. You shouldn't have taken venture money. The, the yeah. one of the goals of a startup is getting enough data so you could figure out where you're putting the chips on the table. But it's not. I'm not taking any risk. You know, there's a great Mario Andretti line that says, you know, when you're driving, if you don't feel like you're out of control, you're not driving fast enough. And that's how it feels in a startup. When people start getting comfortable with, oh, we've gotten to a million bucks, my question is, well, why aren't, when are you getting to 10 million bucks? And when you're at 10 million bucks, I want to know, why aren't you at 25 million bucks? And there might be some reason, and we could, gee, technology adoption, it's, or we were too early, et cetera. Um, but it's a startup, damn it, not a small business. And, and I, maybe it is a small business, or maybe you should, every once in a while I get into one of these meetings and say, well, why don't we just declare this a 501c3 and be done with it? For those of you who don't know, that's a nonprofit. Um, did I answer your question? And it really is a, um, don't let you or your team get complacent. Um, Maybe there's something structurally that was unexpected about the business or market you're in, but you should not be afraid to say, you know, I don't know how to take it from here, or I don't know how to scale this thing into something, you know, that's going to grow substantively. How far to your, you should ask your investors, how far do you want me to take the risk here? And you should be prepared to do this. Because if you're a good founder, the thing that, like, made me um, fearless is that um, if you're good at what you do, you cannot starve to death in the United States. You cannot be unemployable. And if you think you are, and this is a job for life, then don't take venture money, because you're in the wrong business. And I don't, I'm not talking about you, but just in general. I just decided, what a great job to have. I learned new stuff, and like when I screwed it up, I got to do it again. How good is that? And got smarter every time. Did that answer your question? Sure did. Thank you. Yep. Okay, back here. Um, I'll stand up to here. Um, Andrew Boy, startup founder, uh, started to your company. I should take the mic again. Thank you. Um, startup founder, um, to add on to your question and to also ask another, um, we entered into sprints, 60, uh, 60 to 120 day sprints specifically for sales as we were as we got our market data and then we went and proved it out with our sales teams and such like that and we firmly believe and I wanted to tell everyone there, fail fast, fail first and go from there. We, I'm curious on timeline, are we too short, too long? We seem to be picking, B2B or are you? B, yes, B2B, uh, small mid size, small mid market, so companies that are 50 employees to about 1500 is our target. And you have trials? Uh, you? Yes. And how long are your trials? 30 day trial. Yeah, that's the right number. Yep. Uh, and, and so what's the question? Is the six to nine month sprint too long or too short or? Um, sorry, no, um, 60 to 90 day sprints yep. is what we're doing. We're reevaluating on, we're meeting as a team on a weekly basis, uh, reevaluating on a monthly basis. Yeah, the, the only other thing I would suggest is, and you said sales team, so um, I started to vibrate a bit. How big is your sales group? Uh, right now, it's just two of us. We great, that's a great size. <laughs> um, so, so here was, and, and you're probably not making this mistake, but I'll tell you mine when I used to do this, is I used to confuse customer development with sales. Um, and I always, always used to convince, uh, confuse um, every, um, every interaction even when I had sales early on with everybody should give me an order. Not understanding the, the model that says, no, what I'm looking for on day one are other crazy people. Seriously, and in an enterprise back then, and I'm probably a lot different, but at least for me, crazy people, even when I found the right archetype, was one out of 20 in the enterprise. And out of that one out of 20, maybe one out of, fi one out of f five of those or less would give me an order early on because I was a startup. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, yeah, so, no, that, made, that makes sense. So, so to confuse, and I don't, as I said, I don't know if you're doing this, but I used to confuse, okay, I found the right model, I found whatever, great, how come they're not giving me an order without realizing, no, 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 early on, 
there's a different archetype that will buy from me day one when the paint is still wet on my building versus those that will get it nine months from now or a year from now, two years ago. And unless I have that overlay, I was missing a real important signal. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, we, we focused just to, when we first launched, get the 100 units out initially just to have money coming in the door and we yeah. sold just get it out and we started focusing on other markets and now we have two, right. a few different channels we're focusing right. on. So thank you. And, and for, for enterprise sales, for the rest of you, you know, I had a model which I think is still kind of valid is first of all, you want to find people who have a problem, right? B but just because you see there's a problem, they might not know there's a problem. Sometimes you have greater insight than they do. So first, they have to have a problem and two is they have to know they have a problem. Big idea. The third part is, they have to not only know they have a problem, but it had to be important enough that they were actively looking for a solution. Because if they weren't looking for a solution, now you need to spend your time convincing them they need a solution. You don't have enough time in the day as a startup to do that. The third part is, in a, in, in, and again, in a perfect world, not only are they have actively looking for a solution, they try to put one together using piece parts or other things that weren't available and, you know, boy, now you really got somebody motivated, right? It was important enough, they figured it out, they're trying to put together piece parts, and they have or can acquire a budget. Those were the only people I would even bother to talk to in the first year of my startup. Not because the market wasn't large, but those are the only people I had time for because I only had a couple, me and someone else knocking on the door. There was a, a follow-up question right there. Was a, was a follow-up to that question or no? All right, who do you want? Go ahead. Thanks very much. Actually, Thorne may have hinted at this question earlier on, and, and it has to do with the difference. And you talked about large companies, and you've talked a lot about startups. When do you stop being a startup, and is there anything in between startups and large companies? That's a great question. So the answer is yes. Um, um, you know, there are a couple of metrics, and this is, uh, it's both in headcount, culture, um, cash flow, et cetera. Um, So let me start with team size. Anybody know the organization that figured out, you know, how, how organizations scale, the largest organization and the oldest one who's figured out team size? Anybody know? Church? Roman Legion, right? We still organize our militaries around the same kind of organizational structure, and it's because how human beings are hardwired to deal with small groups, larger groups, you know, things like Dunbar's number, right? Everybody know, Dun what's Dunbar's number? Yeah, it's a number of people you mentally could even recognize, and it's about 150. It turns out that's when you divisionalize in a large company. You literally need a new building. Seriously, it's, and in fact, um, and anybody know the size of a military squad? How big is a squad? 150. No, a squad. Any ex-military people? Six to eight to, to 10, right? If you think about it in a startup, that's the most cohesive unit you have. Then you get a platoon, which might be, you know, a bigger, 18 to something. That's a bigger number, still cohesive, but not as cohesive as the original team, right? And, and as you get up in that hierarchy, communication bandwidth becomes the dominant rather than the high bandwidth you had as that squad. Does that make sense so far? At the same time you're scaling the people, hopefully you're scaling the revenue. So you become not a startup when you transition from searching for a business model to executing one. Is that? And by executing one, hopefully that execution means Oh, you're pro you found product market fit, you're generating revenue or cash or something else that allows you to do that scale, but at the same time, you have that scale, you're losing that kind of cohesiveness you had because of the communication, and not only communication bandwidth, that social cohesion, that everybody who did a small company can always talk about the early days when it was great, we were all in the same conference room and we, the whole company can meet X and Y, and it's bittersweet because it's that social cohesion that's gone away. Did I answer your question? So, um, 
KLR and Anthony Mandrelli have provided uh, beer, but Brown is going to take it home and drink it all if we don't all right. if get we don't do it by get get out of the building by by 8 p.m. So what I'm going to suggest is that people are going to want to come up and mm -hmm. and shake your hand and and there's going to end up I, I would say bring your next. They want to shake your hand. You're the one with the yeah. checkbook. Well, right? I, I got some cards here, so you, mm -hmm. if anybody wants a card, uh, you can always uh, you can always talk to me. But I'm going to suggest that we do a hum. Humdinger question, humdinger final question here, the mother of all questions, and then um, we'll, we'll let the rest of them uh, come up and, and say hi to you in person. So raise them high if you think you got the humdinger. Anybody want to auction off their bare hand? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with Tony Barrow back here. Thank you very much for your uh, knowledge here. Uh, I um, like your opinion about when you are getting out, getting out of your comfort zone to meet customers that you know are going to have a real need for your product. And the perspective is that not just talk to your nearby customers, but you really got to travel around the world to get a real perspective of your true potential for the product. So, so I'm sorry, can you frame the question a little more? What's the question? Customers. Yes. A lot of companies fall in the trap of looking for customers within 100 miles of where they are. And to Got really- Got it, so how do you deal with foreign customers and potential- To really find- yeah. To so really is that the find question? your scalable yep. market, your model, you have to really is that the I'm sorry, is that the question? Yes. Oh, yeah. So uh, so I have this heuristic, and um, it's again, I, I love little hierarchies that allow you to kind of shortcut, you know, what does this mean? If you really think about the best data you get, it's actually sitting in front of someone and watching their pupils dilate. No, seriously. If, if their pupils don't dilate when you're you know, listening and they say, okay, I've told you all about, tell me what you're doing, and, and that, that's the only time you're allowed to tell them what you're doing is after like, you've interviewed them and they go, right, we're there. if their eyes don't get wide, right, like there's no interest, or if they're looking at their watch, you, you could pick up that body language, right? We all agree, one-to-one, -one, personally, best thing to do. The problem is if some of your potential customers are in Italy, you have all, well, hey, it's great, we could have some pasta for three weeks, but that's pretty expensive, and I got a business to run, or I got something to run. It's why God invented Skype, right? Or video teleconferencing. It turns out that as long as you have high resolution video, right, it's not as good, but we could go down the hierarchy. I wanna see their facial expressions. I wanna see their desk. I wanna see if they're looking at their watch or playing on their phone or whatever. Because the next level down is I've done a phone call. How many of you have multitasked when you're talking to somebody else? Come on, 100%, go up. You have no idea whether they're nodding or rolling their eyes or something else. You've just disconnected from customer discovery. Then the next level down is an email or a survey monkey, right? Or, oh, I done a survey, I have a thousand people. Again, not bad, but unless I'm cross-correlating cross that data with face-to-face -face data, it's the, like the halftime score is three. Three to what, right? So, so I could get survey data, but unless I've had face-to-face -face contact, either visually, which could solve your problem. So when we do i across the United States, we kind of realize that it's okay. They don't need to be physically talking to customers from Iowa State. They could, as long as they have video conferences, that counts. Not as good as in person, because by the way, when I used to call on people, I'd be reading what was, I learned how to read upside down as good as I could read right side up. Right? You know, I could read everything on their desk, I could read whatever, I could look at what's on their bookshelf, I could see what coffee cups they had from what conferences, and that started a conversation, and you got some physical bonding which you can't get from, this is why I keep saying, one-to-one -one is the most valuable thing you could get, but if you can, it was why I say go to conferences, not to sit in the meetings, but to work the halls. I used to figure out Gardner would throw me out of more conferences I ever paid for in the <laughs> business. And, and, um, and then finally, there's at the bottom of the list, market research data. Um, 
which is, you know, if market researchers were great at predicting the future, they'd be hedge funds managers, but no, unfortunately they're great at predicting the past. Um, and it's sometimes good to have it just to give you a, you know, kind of a sense of the space, but almost always is wrong. Um, and so that's kind of the hierarchy of, of how I approach getting out of the building. It's not that there's one thing you need to do. I want the sum of this because, again, I'm trying to build up a map for myself about how does the industry work, how do the individuals work, where do they play, et cetera. And the test is, here's the test for you, for any, any one of you. Here's a pen, go up to the whiteboard, draw me the diagram of your industry. Then we draw me the diagram about how your company's gonna make money and who they need to talk to and show me the, the flow of, of product and money and through channels and whatever. And the odds of you being able to do that on day one is just low. You might be guessing, but you have no facts. Over time, you're gonna be able to fill out that diagram till you go, got it. Is that, that yeah. was a damn good question. Or at so least, guys, or at least the answer you. was. Thank so you. guys, so was I right about this? Was this money? Good, let's give it up for Steve Blank, author of the Startup Owners Manual.